Uh, all right. So, so hi everyone, and welcome uh, to the Brain Mapping Seminar. It's uh, my pleasure to introduce Dr. Catherine Chang, uh, Katie Chang, uh, who's our speaker today. Uh, so, so, Katie is an assistant professor of uh, EE uh, Computer Science and Biomedical Engineering at Vanderbilt. She received her bachelor's from MIT, uh, a PhD from Stanford, uh, and she was in Gary Glover's lab, and she also worked closely with Vinod Menon. Uh, and was a postdoctoral fellow at, in the NIH Intramural Research Program as part of NINDS. Uh, her research uh, uh, focuses on all aspects of computational analysis of fMRI data. Uh, she, she gave a keynote lecture at OHVM in 2019 uh, on multimodal analysis of spontaneous bold fluctuations. Uh, I was not in the audience for the, for the conference, but, but I watched uh, your set of video lectures, I guess, as a part of the course at OHVM. Uh, on YouTube, uh, where she, where you talked about all these things, uh, and she's written several uh, seminal papers in the field, and, and two of them, uh, which I would strongly recommend uh, to a graduate student uh, starting out in the field of signal processing of fMRI, and and one of them, and I, I like these both these papers very much. And one of them uh, relates uh, the, the heart rate uh, to the bold signal, uh, and it's you call it the, the cardiac response function. And, and the other is uh, looking at the time frequency uh, dynamics uh, of, of resting state, uh, brain connectivity from fMRI. Uh, uh, Katie is also a faculty at the Vanderbilt Alzheimer's uh, Disease Research Center and is a faculty on a T32 training grant uh, on Alzheimer's disease. Uh, so her lab, uh, the Neuroimaging and Brain Dynamics Lab, uh, you call it the, the MURD lab, uh, focuses on uh, developing methods for analyzing the, the temporal dynamics of large scale brain networks, uh, multimodal analysis of EEG and fMRI, and, and generally uh, focusing on all methods aiming to improve uh, fMRI signal quality. And, and so uh, her talk today, and I, and I realized we actually didn't uh, set up the slides or practice the slides, hopefully it's gonna work. So her talk today is about uh, inferring uh, brain states, uh, uh, dynamic brain states uh, from fMRI and relating them to autonomic physiology. So let's welcome uh, Katie. Thank you so much for the introduction and um, thanks for inviting me. I'm excited to chat with you guys today and um, thanks everyone for coming. Um, so I'm gonna be sharing some of our recent work on dynamic brain activity, arousal states and physiology and I'll be excited to hear your thoughts as well. Um, please feel free to stop me anytime if you wanna discuss anything or have any questions. So, um, Traditionally, fMRI research has focused largely on spatial localization, so we might be interested in looking for which brain areas are activated when people are thinking about certain things or presented with certain stimuli, or we might look at connectivity, so which brain areas might be interacting with one another as networks based on measures like correlations in their time series. Um, and these analyses typically use all of the data points across our scan to make a single inference of activity or connectivity. But in fMRI, we're getting um, measurements from the whole brain over time. So this is giving us a rich spatiotemporal view into how signals are changing from moment to moment. And so one thing that we've been particularly interested in is um, what information that we can get from the, the dynamic or the temporal properties of these signals. Um, so how might networks be um, changing over time in their interactions? Um, and how might some of the temporal properties of our signals relate to um, both the stable traits of an individual, as well as to um, the sort of ongoing states that we're continuously moving through, like changes in alertness and emotion. So um, I'm gonna discuss three main directions today. Um, first, I'm gonna uh, briefly share um, a recent exploratory study on linking uh, particular features um, of fMRI time courses to individual differences in behavior. Um, then I'll share studies on um, decoding moment to moment changes in alertness from fMRI and also on um, reconstructing continuous changes in respiratory and cardiac variables based on fMRI signals in the brain. Um, so there is a growing area of fMRI research that is seeking to develop um, data analysis methods that can probe the temporal properties of fMRI. And so, for example, we can look at how um, networks of interacting regions are you know, changing across time over our scan, or we can look at how different brain regions are synchronizing in different frequencies over time, um, and also identify transient patterns as well as spatial temporal sequences in our data. 
And importantly, um, there has been a growing amount of work that indicates that these kinds of dynamic features in our data may offer useful markers of health, health and disease. So they may correlate with certain clinical outcomes as well as behavioral traits like fluid intelligence. Um, and one particular framework for studying dynamic patterns is known as coactivation patterns or CAPS. Um, and so here, uh, the idea is you can think of viewing um, an fMRI scan a bit like a movie. So um, every TR um, or volume of your data is reflecting a kind of multivariate pattern of activity across the brain. Um, and at different points of time in time, you might see similar activity patterns popping up. So maybe at these particular time frames, you see an activity pattern that looks like a bit like this. Um, and maybe at other time points, you see activity patterns that look a bit more like this. And so then to get a handle on the, um, the kind of repertoire of patterns, I guess, that are contained in a data set, um, it's been suggested we might use clustering analysis to um, try to um, you know, group these different patterns into states um, that are represented by the centroids of those clusters. Um, so these might be going to be representative patterns that capture um, the, the, di the different ones that are coming up every time. Um, and so given these kinds of states, um, we can look at metrics like the amount of time a person dwells in a given state or how frequently you switch between states um, and relate these to different phenotypic variables. Um, and so this is just one example of um, a data analysis technique where you can capture quite a bit more information about temporal dynamics compared to standard measures of functional connectivity. And so this is actually a collaboration with Lucina's group, um, I see Lucina, um, led by Zach Goodman in her lab, um, who related these tra uh, transient coactivation patterns to depressive symptoms based on neuropsychiatric assessments um, using a large data set, the NKI Rockland sample. And so um, he found several coactivation patterns, including a state um, that seems to include a lot of activity from the default mode network um, that seem to be more frequently expressed in individuals with higher levels of depressive symptoms. Um, perhaps consistent with work showing that the default mode network is implicated in internal and self-referential um, processing, whereas others that showed more of an activity over um, cognitive control networks tended to show an inverse um, association with depressive symptoms. Um, so many uh, studies in the field of kind of dynamic um, analysis um, use metrics that um, that have something to do with the relation between different regions of the brain. So what are the correlations between different time sources um, across regions or what are their coactivations? Um, but there have also been different lines of work that are showing that the temporal characteristics um, or the characteristics of the kind of individual time courses you can extract from different brain regions might also carry in for interesting information as well. So if you have someone in a resting state scan, you know, they're just have their eyes closed or they're just fixating or something over time, um, and you extract the time courses from different brain areas, they, they can have a variation over space in terms of their frequency characteristics or their complexity. Um, and one of my graduate students, um, Xing Chao, was very interested in this and um, had the idea to explore the extent to which the um, temporal properties in these different regions can um, encode information about individual differences um, or be kind of like a unique fingerprint of a person. Um, and so you can imagine like for each brain region, um, summarizing a temporal feature of that um, signal into something like an entropy measure or, or measuring the amount of low frequency content in that signal um, across different brain regions. Um, so you get some kind of a profile um, extracted from a particular scan. And then we can ask questions like, are these profiles stable within an individual? Um, do they show some distinction between people? And um, might they have any relation to cognition and behavior? Um, and so to test this idea, he used um, data from the Human Connectome Project and extracted regions from a 90, um, a 90 region atlas. Um, and these are kind of embedded into 14 larger scale uh, networks. Um, and he specifically looked at uh, two measures of um, brain dynamics. So one is the fractional amplitude of the um, of the power spectrum that is, um, or of the signal that is under um, 0.1 hertz. So it's like a, a measure of low frequency power um, in the signal, um, as well as a measure of temporal complexity as a kind of complementary nonlinear measure. Um, and so since the subjects are scanned over two different days, um, one thing we can do to test whether these kinds of profiles carry information about a person is to ask whether these kinds of vectors, um, if you measure it on one day from a subject, does it show the highest match with its own 
with that same subject on a second day compared to other subjects. So this is kind of like a fingerprinting type analysis. Um, so that's represented here. Um, the, this is the similarity um, between those vectors um, profiles of each subject on day one versus day two. And so, um, uh, and, and for different subjects. So the, the diagonal is show, uh, represents like um, the same subject on two different days. And the IJ entry is like the correspondence between like subject I and subject day, J on you know, day one versus day two. Um, and so the kind of heavy diagonal, it's obvious here, um, indicates that the same subject um, tends to have a profile that correlates more strongly with itself than with the other subjects. And um, the correlate classification um, rate was around 80, high 80 percentile. Um, and uh, so we thought that was interesting. It's actually higher than I, than I expected from um, a rather, I guess, um, a simple measure of uh, you know power in in the signals. Um, so we also tested to what extent that um, this kind of is dependent on the spatial segmentation of different regions. So if we use a ninety region atlas versus say averaging within larger regions like fourteen net, um, fourteen networks, um, how you know how does that compare? And it, it does seem to really matter. So if we used this finer grained 90 region atlas, then we saw these high correspondences um, between subjects or between the same subject and itself, um, uh, you know, comparing with between the two days as well as between days. Um, whereas when we took the average over a larger region, um, this 14 networks, then we didn't really see that. And that's kind of comforting because if we could, if, you, if it worked with any random measure, then it would be kind of hard to, to know if that was meaningful. Um, and finally, we just did some exploring of whether these profiles co-varied with any of the behavioral measures that were collected from these subjects. Um, and we implemented that using canonical correlation analysis. Um, and so we found that the first canonical um, correlation mode um, was significant uh, with permutation testing. And um, once you once you get these kind of um, weightings between the brain and behavior that relate to each other, you can also look at what those loadings are on both the brain in both the brain space as well as behavior. And so it's kind of still hard to interpret, um, uh, but we can we can kind of you know um, see which ones may have the highest weights, for example. Um, and interestingly, one of them was um, sleep quality. And um, previous work has shown that there has been some relation to the frequency content of the signal and how drowsy people are, which I'll show in, in a little, little bit as well from our own work. So um, this was a, a pretty exploratory study. And um, I think that you know one reason I was somewhat surprised that it works well is that um, we do see a lot of changes in these signals over time. And here we were kind of collapsing that temporal information into a single value. Um, and so we're planning to, um, you know, delve more into the mechanisms that are driving this and examine the relation with brain states as well. So um, the studies that I just mentioned um, so far have related fMRI dynamics to um, either individual uh, differences between individuals um, or with cognitive or behavioral measures from a person. And those measures are often recorded in separate assessments outside of a scanner. <laughs> but we might also ask to what degree an fMRI measure is actually mirror, mirroring the more instantaneous or moment-to-moment -moment changes in mental and physiological states that are, people are going through during the scan itself. And there's growing support that there is a relationship. So um, these are earlier studies that established that um, the amplitude as well as the connectivity of um, spontaneous fMRI signals um, measured at a particular point in time were related to a person's behavioral responses or perce perceptual awareness of, of an incoming stimulus. Um, and there has been a lot of work showing links with, um, you know, mind wandering, you know, on an, on an ongoing basis um, and emotion as well. And uh, this is a recent review article that was led by my research assistant, Caroline, um, synthesizing a, a lot of this work. And um, from one perspective, the fact that someone's brain state during a scan can impact their connectivity or activity measures can be viewed as a confound, especially if we're trying to look for stable markers of individual traits. Um, but on the other hand, it also means that we 
we have a window into like how brain activity is dynamically changing to support these, um, these different states. And so in this context, we've been particularly interested in vigilant states. And I'm gonna use this term synonymously with phenomena like wakefulness um, or alertness. And um, I know that these terms may have, um, you know, different uses across the literature. So I apologize for kind of using them all synonymously. Um, so people are, they often get sleepy during fMRI scans. Um, sometimes it's really hard to keep people awake. Um, and vigilance um, regulation has been altered in a number of brain disorders as well. So that's another reason I think that it quite, could be quite interesting to study this. Um, in prior work, it's been shown that fMRI signals can change quite dramatically as people become more drowsy and fall asleep. So in particular, there can be systematic differences in the amplitude of um, signal fluctuations, as well as correlations between different regions. And several studies have also shown that um, connectivity between specific brain networks may also change as a function of vigilance. And so as one example from our earlier work, um, what we did in the study was to monitor EEG concur concurrently with fMRI. Um, and that's because EEG provides a more um, well-known um, you know, measure of alertness. Um, and this can be obtained, for example, by looking at um, how much power there is in frequency bands like alpha and theta. And so um, here, you know, we have EEG together with fMRI. So um, we can look at whether changes over time in the power in certain EEG frequency bands um, relates to changes in fMRI connectivity over time. And the main finding from the study I, um, was that in time points where um, the EEG um, power spectra indicated that the person was more likely to be um, drowsy, uh, there tended to be stronger correlations between default mode and dorsal attention network compared to when subjects were more, were more alert. And when you can even see more, um, you know, you see more weak correlations, but you also see more negative correlations there. So um, one thing that this suggests is that um, we can start to map fMRI dynamics, you know, that, that, you know, if we didn't have EEG, it would be kind of hard to know what this means, but um, there may be some relation between the, the changes in connectivity over time within a scan and a person's um, brain state, um, including vigilance. Um, and another thing that this kind of highlights is that even if you didn't have some measure like EEG, um, we might be able to use the fMRI data alone to get a window into the internal state of a person and, you know, be able to tell what brain state they might be in during some portion of our scan. So um, that was a goal of some of our subsequent studies. And so um, more recently, we've been asking, you know, to what extent can we infer continuous fluctuations in someone's vigilance or wakefulness from fMRI itself? Um, so is it possible to take an fMRI data set, you know, no other measures like pupillometry or behavior, you know, it's maybe just resting state. Um, and based on the patterns that are in that data, can we figure out, you know, on a moment to moment basis, how awake somebody might be? Um, so here we developed an approach that uses spatial pattern information in order to estimate um, time courses of alertness across fMRI. And so the starting point um, is we do need something to train to learn a kind of pattern associated with alertness. And so we use concurrent fMRI and EEG data. Um, and based on the, the areas that are highly correlated with EEG, um, we get a, a single kind of static 3D map here, which we call a template of activity that's linked with alertness. Um, and then the idea is that, you know, with EEG, we, we already know kind of, you know, based on EEG, you can help us figure out what, um, what arousal state a person's in. But if we don't have concurrent EEG anymore, can we just take an fMRI scan and take this pattern as a starting point and use that to, to, to derive um, a time course that um, captures fluctuations in vigilance that you might measure from EEG? So the EEG, importantly, is not used, you know, in this test scan. Um, it's only, um, you know, superimposed as validation. So the, the time course, this fMRI alertness index was obtained using only the fMRI data together with the pattern like this.
Um, one other thing I wanted to mention here is, although I just showed a study that used time-windowed correlations, um, this is not using time-windowed correlations. Um, it's, it's using a single kind of activity multivariate pattern um, to kind of figure out these fluctuations on a TR by TR basis. So you have the temporal resolution, the same temporal resolution as your fMRI um, data itself. Um, so one of the things that we were interested in um, and exploring is um, so in, in these earlier in the earlier studies we we showed that it um, could closely match an EEG uh, measure of alertness, um, but what about behavioral variability? So if someone is performing a task, um, and like suppose you show you have you know somebody. Um, they just hear a, a tone, like a, just a beep, like when they're in the scanner, and they're supposed to push a button as soon as they can after the tone um, occurs. Um, even if you're presenting the same tone over and over, you're still gonna get variability in the person's reaction time to the tone, just naturally. Um, and we hypothesize that some, some amount of that variability might relate to how alert someone is. There are, of course, other sources of that variability as well, perhaps like mind wandering or, um, you know, distraction, but um, but but maybe some portion of that variability can be explained by someone's level of alertness. And so, what we did um, was basically to take a brief um, five-second period before each auditory tone was presented, and then we used our inferred level of fMRI uh, or vigilance derived from our fMRI um, data, and. Um, and asks the question of whether um, the level of vigilance we predict in this pre-stimulus interval um, could predict that um, could could relate to you know the subject's um, reaction time to an incoming stimulus. And um, this project was led by my PhD student Sarah Goodale. And um, the first um, result that we looked at was um, separating hits versus misses. So. Um, can this fMRI-derived alertness measure distinguish between trials where a person responded versus ones where they didn't? Because they would actually miss quite a few. I think people were really sleepy in our scans. Um, and so we found that, that there was a difference. Um, and then another thing we can do is um, basically zoom in to the, to the time when it, around a tone, when a tone was presented. So if we take like an event-locked average, of our predicted fMRI alertness measure um, around the time that a tone is presented, um, the trials that have responses um, differentiated from the trials that were missed. And that differentiation was even apparent before the stimulus comes on, which is essentially the same information that's captured here. Um, and uh, we also noticed this bump in activity here. Um, which we speculated might relate to a tone actually kind of waking someone up if they um, if they were kind of drifting to sleep. I should actually mention that the tones were spaced apart by um, by quite a bit in time. So they were like they were random and they were like at least 25 seconds apart. So they were a bit like each one was a bit like an oddball and someone could very well kind of drift off between um, between tones. So potentially um, could cause kind of an increase in alertness and um, we could, because we have the EEG recorded for validation, we, we can also look at the event locked um, EEG power spectra, you know, around the time a stimulus was presented. And we also see this kind of increase in the alpha band, like shortly after a person was, um, uh, after the tone was presented, um, maybe relating to that. So um, this study, I mean, um, you know, suggests that we might be able to infer someone's arousal state um, in a way that's linked with their moment-to-moment -moment behavior um, and at pretty high temporal resolution since we are estimating a value for every single TR in our fMRI scan. Um, we further looked at um, trials where subjects made fast versus slow responses because, um, yeah, like we weren't interested in whether it could more finely differentiate those types of reaction times um, and there it was able to, to some extent. Um, and so, and and we kind of like looked into, you know, we would kind of expect a graded response from faster to slower reaction times to misses as well, um, which we see in our alertness index as well as in the EEG, which we're treating as a ground truth measure. Um, and finally, we asked the question of whether we can 
derive these estimates of vigilance from a, a, a very small amount of, of the brain. So the spatial map that I had showed originally um, covers, you know, it, it has a value at every voxel that we scanned in. So it's, um, it's a very large um, global pattern. Um, but is it possible that we can still have predictive information when we pare it down to the most highly um, weighted positive and negative values in that um, in that template map, and it seemed that that would be that that was the case. Um, in fact, so um, if we take only the top um, one percent of values with highest positive and negative intensities, then this maintained high predictive accuracy. And one reason that I think that um, this is happening is because there's um, there's quite global effects of vigilance across the brain, and in that sense. Um, different voxels show highly correlated information. So it makes sense that we may be able to compress like, um, you know, a lot of voxels that are correlated with each other into like a single representative voxel, for example. Um, but what really made a difference was um, keeping the voxels that were of opposite sign. So um, if we only looked at positive voxel or, you know, negatively correlated voxels and only took a few representative negative voxels then, um, or positive um, alone, then the um, the accuracy dropped off um, the smaller and smaller number of voxels we took. But it seemed to be that keeping the voxels that had, you know, um, the set of voxels that jointly show positive and negative activity was um, what was, uh, you know, the most highly predictive. So as long as we retain those voxels, then we could get a very good estimate. Um, and then it's also interesting to consider where those voxels are. So if we do pare this down to 1% of the greatest positive and negative voxels, um, the, the most negative ones were in primary visual cortex. Um, interesting, um, but consistent with some prior literature. Um, and, and I should mention that the subjects had their eyes closed the entire time during these scans. This was a purely auditory task. Um, and also in the ventricles, which um, are often treated as uh, you know, like we, we often will just mask out the ventricles or not consider them because we think, you know, this is not neural. Um, and I think that one reason it could be in the ventricles is, um, is in fact, because of um, a, a more of a kind of a brain physiology type phenomenon. Um, and so uh, there have been related studies looking at sleep, um, for example, that have found that there are um, kind of slow fluctuations in the um, brain's um, vascular tone, like your cerebral blood volume um, during sleep. And when you have global changes in um, your, your brain vasculature, then that can modulate the amount of CSF that's in your brain as well. Um, and the drivers of these um, vascular changes might be coordinated either by neural or autonomic activity or both. And um, we had been studying autonomic activity um, in, a, in some studies um, around this time as well. Um, and so um, one, one effect that closely matched the, the maps we were seeing linked with arousal was um, what we had also come upon studying sympathetic nervous system activity. Um, and so if there's, if there's an increase in arousal, um, this often comes together with an increase in you know, your heart rate and as well as a, a constriction of blood vessels um, at the brain, but also you can measure it peripherally. So we have the sensors at the fingertip, uh, PPG, um, that can, you know, it measures your heartbeats, but it can also, um, it also has um, an amplitude to it, which can indicate um, vasoconstriction. Um, and we found that um, it's particularly in sleep, but also in other brain states, um, autonomic events like this um, came with a sudden decrease in um, bold signal across the gray matter together with an opposite change in the white matter in the CSF. Um, and, I, and an idea that could be happening that was um, proposed um, in this work and by my um, in my postdoc uh, lab um, with Jeff Dunn um, uh, suggests that the the sympathetic uh, nervous system response could lead to a constriction of blood vessels in the brain um, that leads to reduced blood volume, and that could also modulate um, flow of flow of CSF. Um, and in separate uh, work, we also found that this is, you know, closely related to respiration and to heart rate as well. And in fact, if we remove these kinds of physiological effects from our data, um, in the previous study I showed, um, we could actually predict behavior um, not as well 
So um, I think that the patterns that we're looking for in the signal that's detecting these changes in alertness are picking up on a joint neural and um, physiological um, influence that's related to these um, brain states. So um, to summarize this part, we find that um, you know, fluctuations in alertness are closely linked with changes in fMRI signals and connectivity. Um, and that the patterns may be reliable enough to allow us to extract vigilance information from fMRI alone um, and also capture, to some extent, task-related behavioral variability. Um, and one um, reason that this might be useful is that a lot of fMRI data sets don't have any indicators of alertness like EEG or pupillometry or behavior. So if we can read out someone's brain state information based on the fMRI alone, then maybe we can use that in interesting ways. So um, we might look at how these brain state effects are interacting with behavior and cognition, um, or we might remove them if that's something that we're not interested in, or we might you know, isolate the time points where people are sleeping and remove those from our analysis if we're not interested in that. So um, this can just um, maybe more generally um, inform what kind of state a person is in during our scans. Um, so the, when we, um, so far we've been focusing, you know, on, on neuroimaging measurements primarily, um, but the more I um, got interested in, in vigilance and started studying these um, signals, the more um, it became apparent that there are these close connections between the brain and body that we just can't ignore. Um, so uh, changes in vigilance, you know, are really closely linked with these autonomic effects, you know, as I mentioned, breathing and heart rate, brain vasculature. Um, and one um, illustration of this phenomenon is um, in recent work from Michael Chi's lab. So um, they were looking at microsleeps. So if you have someone in a scanner and or this happens to us like all the time, but um, you can have uh, in, in the scanner, especially when it's um, kind of boring, um, you may have people that just drift off to sleep uh, momentarily. So you may have a brief uh, sleep event, a microsleep. And at the, um, they, they actually time locked um, different microsleep events and studied changes in um, fMRI signals, as well as um, peripheral physio physiological measures um, like heart, heart rate and respiratory variation. Um, and can find um, reliable changes in these, um, these measurements um, at the occurrence of microsleeps. Um, my uh, postdoc in our lab, um, Ben Gold, has been um, also looking at connections between physiology and, um, and states of um, alertness, arousal. Um, more in a, in, a, in a wakeful state, but also kind of considering gradual transitions between um, wake and sleep. So one phenomena that we can see pretty clearly in the data is that when people are becoming more sleepy, um, the, covari the covariation between um, bold and physiological signals seems to get stronger. Um, there's also more, tends to be a lot more variation in physiological signals themselves um, as, as people are becoming more drowsy. And um, so if we look kind of, uh, you know, if we kind of quantify that um, in terms of um, looking at the, the fMRI whole brain average signal, um, one thing that we can see is that when people are more alert, um, you have kind of less of a contribution from peripheral physiology than you do when people are more sleepy. Then there seems to be a larger component of the global signal is explained by physiology. Um, and I think that the peripheral um, physiological changes are really interesting um, to study in fMRI, not only because of their relation with vigilance, but um, just because they have such a close connection with bold signals um, because we're, me we're measuring you know, changes in blood oxygenation. And um, if you have natural physiological modulation, so like you know, changes in um, your respiration, over time, like how, how um, deeply or quickly you're breathing. Um, these have been found to come with um, changes, reliable changes in bold signals. And in fact, if you take a deep breath, um, the modulation of your bold signal can be even higher than you can get, like, you know, that's induced by, um, you know, some cognitive uh, activity, some, you know, you change in a local neural metabolism. So, um, we have been, um, so there's, there's multiple ways that physiological signals um, relate to fMRI. And um, 
um, one um, very well-known effect is like, you know, as you breathe in and out, like these fast breathing cycles, you get a, a kind of an instantaneous modulation of your bolt or your fMRI signals um, having to do with magnetic field changes um, due to like kind of motion of your body um, with breathing. Um, but in addition to that, um, these slower, like low frequency changes in respiratory volume are influencing bold signals um, through a bit of a different mechanism that relates to changes in, um, you know, vascular tone and the, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, it increases uh, levels of carbon dioxide, you know, in your brain, if you hold your breath, for example, and that can um, really cause um large changes in, in blood flow and oxygenation across the brain. So um, these slow effects tend to be more challenging to disentangle from our neurally driven effects um, than some of these faster ones. And the reason is because they share a lot of similar properties. So they, they have a power spectrum that's in the low frequencies, just like a lot of neurally driven bold signals. And they are also um, most prominent in gray matter um, and, and are quite wide, widespread. Um, so methods like um, ICA, spatial ICA, um, are quite effective at separating out these faster, like periodic um, effects, but uh, not so much the slower ones, um, since they do, you know, overlap so closely with, with brain networks. Um, and so it's an illustration, you know, if you take a subject that's been um, cleaned, you know, to a large extent, you know, uh, ICA is great at cleaning up motion and, and, and a number of the other physiological effects. Um, uh, and you look at their correlation uh, matrix um, between different brain regions. Um, if a scan has a lot of um, modulation of, you know, cardiac or, you know, heart rate and, and um, respiratory volume, these slower changes, um, then there can still be um, quite a bit of that left over so that if you, you, if you, you might have to do, go through a separate regression step to, to remove those effects. Um, and so one of my um, interests has been in how we can model these effects, um, these slow physiological changes um, in terms of how they manifest in fMRI signal changes. And so one of our approaches has been to record these um, peripheral signals during our scans, um, like a, a belt around the waist to measure breathing or like a pulse ox to, to get heart rate and um, can try to estimate transfer functions that relate changes in physio physiology to changes in bold signal. Um, so like if you have a heart rate signal and you maybe convolve it with a particular response function kind of analogously to how we convolve our stimulus onset times with uh, HRF, because we know that there's some delay, et cetera, when, we, um, when, it, uh, when it propagates into to, to bold uh, responses. Um, we also may need to you know, derive certain functions here that can relate physiology to fMRI. Um, so, but one thing I want to mention is that, you know, this is often treated as an artifact um, in our data. Um, and it may be uh, considered, you know, like that may be, um, a, a confound if you're not interested in um, these autonomic changes um, themselves. Um, but there's a there's also um, ways that these types of signals can be useful, um, and that monitoring physiology in general can be useful. Um, so there are you know brain body interactions in in health and disease. Um, the the relationship between physiological signals and fMRI can be used to study um, brain vasculature, brain vascular reactivity. Um, and, um, and also like the changes in heart rate, for example, can give us a measure of someone's physiological state as well. Um, maybe like their vigilant state. Mm -hmm. So, um, it is valuable to monitor these signals during our scans. Um, but one problem that we often face in practice is that, uh, the signals that we, the signals are either absent, like. I don't know, we forgot to put it, put it on a <laughs> person. I've like done that before and realized that I wanted um, respiration belt data and had completely forgot to put it on the subject. Um, or it is, um, you know, corrupted in mysterious ways. Sometimes it's corrupted because someone moves, but sometimes depending on the hardware that's used to acquire the signals, um, you know, you look at a data set later and it's not exactly clear what went wrong, but there is some problem with like, you know, overranging and things like that. Um, and so one question that we asked um, was, 
to what extent we can actually infer these components of you know, respiration and, and cardiac um, variations from fMRI itself, like if you don't have physiological measures. And so this is sort of in similar spirit to what we were trying to do with the arousal state. Um, and so a little picture of our goal um, was to be able to take fMRI data as input, like the time courses from different brain regions, and to be able to output a continuous prediction of someone's respiration volume or heart rate um, that matches what you would see if you extracted this from the recorded peripheral data. And so just to emphasize these are like the, the kind of low frequency modulation of the amplitude of respiration rather than like the individual breaths. Um, and so this was a first proof of concept study, I guess, on this. Uh, we, we looked at respiration variation specifically, and we took human connectome project data and um, looked at um, the ability of to do this with a, a convolutional neural, neural network, as well as a simple linear single unit network, so basically a linear model. So these are some of the example results. Um, this is reconstructed from the convolutional neural network, and these are kind of ranges of goodness of how it performed. So the, the reconstructed time course based on the brain fMRI um, data is in orange, and then the measured one is in green. Um, sometimes it was possible to predict these really well. Sometimes there was less of an agreement, um, sometimes worse than this too. Um, but um, in general, we were kind of encouraged that this information may be, you know, extracted from fMRI. Um, in addition to looking at the time courses, we can also look at what the kind of predicted um, uh, uh, bold, you know, patterns are to these respiration changes. So this is mapping out, like for each voxel, we characterize the amount of temporal variance in that voxel that is explained by respiration. Um, and can find a good match between the predicted and measured patterns. And this was uh, led by um, Jorge and Rosa in, in our lab. So um, those were kind of single subject examples. These are more of summary statistics. Um, so we use Pearson correlation between the um, predicted and measured signals as our, um, as our performance metric. And um, we also looked across different strategies for pre-processing your data. And one thing we wondered in particular was like, um, if you like if head motion, so there's some correlation between things like head motion and breathing. Um, and so if we leave head motion in the data rather than removing it, can we actually, cause does it help us predict um, physiology? And it does, but not a whole lot, just a little bit. Maybe it's like, you, it's not significant by any means, but you know, it's just like slightly, slightly higher than if you regress out the head motion. Um, and one other thing that, that uh, was interesting to me was that the performance of a more complicated network was not significantly better than a very simple linear model in this case. So with a linear model, one nice thing is we can go in and look at the filter weights to see um, you know, try to interpret in a little bit more detail, um, you know, how different brain regions are being weighted into that prediction and across time too. So we had used a kind of sliding windowed approach here where um, for a window of time, we try to predict the center point of respiration. And then we slide that along to predict by one point and we predict the next center point, et cetera. So we basically have this kind of like filter that we're sliding over time to predict um, the respiratory changes. And we can look at the filter weights um, and finds like, you know, certain regions are um, more heavily weighted and there seems to be a kind of bi bipolar um, response, like a, at some time point it's weighted positively and some negatively. And that's actually consistent with the, um, the mappings shown in, in previous literature, like by Rasmus Byrne, um, that uh, capture the relationship between um, physi physiology and fMRI. Mm -hmm. Um, so that was a, our initial study on that, and we've been trying to um, improve this in various ways. So um, one, one thing we are trying to do is jointly predict respiration and cardiac changes. So um, there is a lot of information shared between these um, waveforms. So if we can share a model architecture to try to predict them, um, or parts of that anyway, then we can, um, then we thought maybe this would be helpful. Um, and also, we, even though that five-layer CNN was comparable to a, you know, a um, linear model, we wondered how much better we can do if we bring more 
state of the art, I guess, deep learning methods to, to this problem. And so uh, Rosa has been starting to explore more along those lines. And we can boost the performance um, quite a bit. So from the previous study, our, our correlations were around the 0.5 range, but we can boost them um, to the high, like or almost 0.7 for, um, for respiration, like on, on, as the median value. Um, and not not so high, but 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 not bad either for heart rate. Um, and another thing that we wonder is if these models can extend to um, different task conditions as well. So that was a uh, resting state data, but um, like if we were to just take out of the box with no fine tuning the model that was trained on resting state data and um, and throw it at task data, like. Would it do badly? You know how how much of a difference would there be? And um, compared to the resting state data, there was a um, it was not as good for the tasks. So we may indeed have to kind of like do more training of our model with tasks data, etc. But um, it was it was not like it was still encouraging. I would say that we could do pretty well in in predicting um, some scans. Um, and then as one um, illustration of um, the potential impacts that this could have is if you are not interested in physiology as something of interest, but rather are interested in removing it from your data, um, can we use our models to kind of predict that component to remove and um, how, what Im impact would it have on mapping resting state networks, for example. So um, if we looked at default mode network correlations before regressing out physiological signals, we might get a pattern like this. Um, and then after regressing out physiological signals that were measured, um, we can get more anti-correlations showing up. Um, that's one thing that's been um, shown in the literature before too. Um, and we can approximate that fairly well when measuring, when projecting out um, the predicted physio physiological signals as well. Um, so uh, that is all I'm gonna present. <laughs> um, so in summary, um, fMRI studies or signals are very rich, um, both in terms of their spatial patterns of functional organization as well as the, the temporal dynamics. Um, we can extract information about ongoing vigilant states and physiology from fMRI signals. And um, finally, I think that studying these physiological states can lead to firstly helping us improve or improve our interpretation or understanding of our signals and may themselves lead to the development of new fMRI biomarkers. And in other lines of work where we have collaborations um, with uh, clinical researchers to look at um, the relevance of these signal changes in um, epilepsy as well as Alzheimer's disease. So I would like to thank my lab and collaborators and thanks um, to you all for coming. Thanks, Katie, for such an excellent talk. Uh, any questions? So, so feel free to unmute yourself and just ask questions. So we, we have one comment, I guess, or, or a question in chat by Joe, uh, if you can see it, Katie. So uh, it talks about, we'll ask about the sympathetic tone changes in REM sleep. Uh, oh yeah, that is, um... That's very interesting. Um, so um, we haven't looked at this yet, although I think that would be really fascinating. And um, when I was um, at the NIH, a colleague of mine was collecting overnight sleep scans, um, which was a, a challenging feat, but uh, managed to get people to sleep in the scanner for, for some number of hours um, and collected a, a fair amount of REM sleep data. So I think that it's it's possible to study you know, REM sleep and these these effects. So yeah, thanks for mentioning that because I think that would be a really interesting uh, direction. Hi, Katie. <laughs> Great talk. Uh, I always learn so much from your presentations. Um, I was really curious about the global signal um, results that you mentioned in one of your slides. Um, if I got this correctly, is it that um, you know the global signal contains different amounts of the physiological signal depending on the arousal state? Was that a finding? Yeah. So that's so interesting. I mean, so obviously you know I'm interested in this in general, but like, what does that mean for you know removing the global signal in terms of you know, um, applying across subjects, you know, given different subjects are going to fluctuate through arousal states. And what's, what are sort of the implications 
for how we think about that pre-processing step um, based on what you've, you've seen. Yeah, for sure. Awesome um, question. Cause yeah, that's something that has been on my mind uh, as well. Like, um, so I think in practice, there are some implications for how we think about removing sig the global signal. I mean, we tend to remove the whole brain average, regardless of what brain state is, uh, it is, um, but the models may be may slightly different. And um, what we're removing as global signal may mean slightly different things in different scans too, uh, which you alluded to. So um, if someone is very drowsy in their scan, um, the global signal, global signal regression and what the global signal is reflecting is maybe more strongly related to to physiology, these low frequency physiological effects, um, and to, to vigilance fluctuations too, because these drowsiness effects are also very global and co-vary to, to a large extent with, with the physiological changes. So I think that if you do physiological or global signal regression in a subject that's very drowsy, then you probably are actually removing a lot of these drowsiness and physiological fluctuations. Whereas if you have a person who is more alert, their, their whole brain average signal may be composed of uh, other things more than the global than, than these physiological effects. And so maybe there's a larger chance that you're regressing out real neural, you know, not so the other effects are not real, but like um, neural like network signals um, from from our data if we if we do global signal and alertness. So yeah, um, that's a really interesting <laughs> question what to do. <laughs> Thanks. And does that have implications for instructions that we might give participants as well? Like um, well, I was also thinking about the breath respiration kind of effects. Like normally we don't tell people how to breathe in the scanner, but is, is it something we should think about in any way? <laughs> Maybe some making suggestions. Yeah. Um, I've also thought of it like that because I wonder if like, you know, when you tell someone not to do something, then that's what you have to do. <laughs> so if you tell them, like, when I think, when I go in the scanner, I'm always, like, I'm thinking not, of not breathing in a strange ways, and that makes me breathe in strange ways. Um, so I think that, like, ideally, it would be great if that was something that was more controlled. Um, but in practice, I'm not sure how to get um, people to do that. Some studies have actually had people do a low-level kind of respiratory feedback task, like, during their scans. So you might have a, a breathing belts, but also, like, that's um, the measurements are kind of, um, you have to keep your breathing within a certain range during the scan, but that itself is, I guess, cognitive. Um, but yeah, that's, I think that what I would suggest probably is that recording these signals or like, you know, trying to use the models we're, we're trying to come up with um, for inferring those um, could be useful there too, because you at least um, know what's going on um, and can, can make decisions on a more individualized basis, I guess, in terms of how to process the data. And yeah, a goal of our, um, our our deep learning studies is that, yeah, maybe we can peel off that component or know how much um, there is a contribution from physiology in a given scan if we don't happen to have those recordings available. Thanks so much. There's a question on chat by Amrita. Oh, okay, I see it now. So um, was there a particular breathing pattern uh, associated with alertness and how to quantify that. Yeah, so I mean, um, one of the trends that we saw is um, is if we had EEG measured concurrently, so we can kind of like stage different segments of data, um, there there tend to be to be a larger amount of variability in the respiration signal as people were becoming more drowsy. Um, and to some extent, like if you look at the um, kind of moment to moment changes in the EEG like power signals, which are probably like some neural reflection of vigilance. Um, you can also see some correlation between that and the respiration too. So um, it, it was a moderate level though. It wasn't like there was a perfect overlap between them, but um, there also seemed to be slightly stronger correlations between those signals as people were more drowsy. Um, so I guess it's, um, yeah, the kind of breathing patterns we say we see associated with alertness. Now, when, when people are alert, like they, you can voluntarily take deep breaths and things like that too. Um, but um, I think, yeah, it'll be interesting to look more closely at, um, at, at all those aspects of the signals. So, sorry, going back to Lucina's question real quick. Uh, Yes, so global signal regression is one thing, but, but all these uh, physiological signals, is it a good idea or a standard practice now 
should it be a standard practice to remove them every time you conduct an fmr experiment or are you getting rid of some bio feature uh, yeah. um that is like kind of one question that that we're studying at the moment because um if those were completely decoupled from neural activity then and if it was something that you were not interested in studying for your particular goal then it would be a good idea to record those signals know what's going on um and and project them out in some way um but i guess the tricky part is the more I look at this, the more um, I notice how strongly correlated um, neural activity is with physiology and tasks. For example, um, we in that in that um, auditory tones task um, or in similar tasks that I've studied, even like a tiny change in tone. If you average the physiology, you can see a, actual like a change in heart rate or something that's locked to even a really small change in the stimulus. And so I think that a lot of stimulus related um, brain or uh, bold signals or, or fMRI signals are um, maybe have some component of physiology in them too. And so if we, if they co-vary, then if we remove one, then we're definitely removing some of what we're interested in as well. Um, and so, yeah, I guess um, sometimes, so yeah, I, I, we're, we're kind of like getting a clear idea of how, if whether it's possible to um, remove these in a way that, that can preserve some neural signal, like maybe not just regression, but some other methods um, maybe can be helpful. And, um, and also, yeah, like measuring them tends to be helpful just to know when there's task related physiology, because it can really change your interpretation of, of your signals. Um, I have a question about the uh, convolutional neural network, and I believe it's for predicting the resting state fMRI. So what kind of do you recall what kind of loss you were using there? Because you said at times like the prediction could potentially be off or bad. I, I was kind of curious, like what kind of loss function was being used on the time series? Yeah, um, so in that particular study, we used a mean squared error loss, um, but we also have been kind of looking at correlation losses as well because the we normalize the amplitudes of these signals before we do um, this because, well, I guess one challenging thing about the whole um, I guess fMRI in general, but like for these machine learning um, problems is that like, um, yeah, the fMRI units are kind of arbitrary and the physiological units are also arbitrary too. Um, and so we end up um, normalizing them like zero mean unit variance. And then, and then we experimented with mean squared error and correlation um, for that study. And they were relatively similar. So we went with mean squared error um, for that one. So, th so this thing about getting resting state uh, signals from task experiment, uh, and there's some work on that. So you can do a task experiment, but actually get resting state signals. Uh, have you actually looked into that with, with these methods, uh, especially since you can, at a fine grained level, uh, I guess, account for many of these variabilities, uh, but also confirm tasks as well. So like um, to take um, like task activation, um, patterns and figure out what somebody's resting state networks might look like, something like yeah. that. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's really interesting. Um, so we haven't um, tried to kind of do a mapping in that direction, but I know that there is um, there is work kind of going both directions. Um, one I'm thinking of was um, they showed that, yeah, and I'm trying to remember which direction it was. They could either predict task responses very well in a very fine grained spatial boundaries from looking at from a, like their resting state data or vice versa, but it, it was very convincing and um, it was a science paper from like 20, 2016. Okay, Michael Cole, yeah. Lucina, Lucina just mentioned it is Michael Cole. Oh, oh okay, great. Yes, and, and he has also been, yeah, that's right. Um, right, uh, doing a lot of interesting work in that space um, for sure, yeah. Uh, any, any other questions? Uh, so, so the CSF finding was actually pretty cool uh, in, in the ventricles, I thought. And uh, I don't know, are you, are you, do you want to expand more a bit on that and what direction is that work headed? So that, that was, that kind of fell out, I guess, from your study. I mean, you're not looking, you didn't go looking for that, but uh, do, do you plan to <laughs> uh, think, I mean, yeah. focus on that? 
more in yeah well i mean i mean it's um it's interesting what what mechanisms give rise to that in particular so um i think there's a lot of work from um you know people i've been collaborating with and other groups that have been um trying to study that both in wake and in sleep um and um, yeah, we it's 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 so closely related with changes in cardiac and respiratory activity as well, which I think is not surprising when we like kind of think about like how what large scale effects it's having on bold signals. Um, so I think that's um, kind of understanding the mechanisms and um, and I guess um, yeah, this is a this is a, an interesting direction. Um, All right. So, so if there are uh, no further questions, let's let's thank uh, Katie uh, for a great talk uh, and for coming on on Zoom. Uh, hopefully, we would love to have you in person someday uh, and present. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, uh, so this is the end of the seminar, and see you guys next.